creatures, humans, or whatever's reached insane levels of power, who are worshipped, or have some role in creating the world the game takes place in. Those seem like pretty godly powers to me, wouldn't you agree? Now, most RPGs have a god or goddess in it. The benevolent one helps you along the way, while the ancient evil darkness is usually a fallen god or just straight up a god of evil. Whatever the case, we're looking at these gods and goddesses who were downright cruel and ended up being a major antagonist or even the final boss. I don't say this every time, but I try and keep it to one per franchise so that the list is a bit more varied. Also, this should be super obvious, but major spoilers ahead. Please note that there will be no confirmed alien life forms who are worshipped as gods or goddesses on this list, such as Lavos from Chrono Trigger. That will be on another list for another time. Ready? Let's get this done. Number 10, Zophar, Lunar 2 Eternal Blue. Destruction's only purpose is to spread evil across the universe. No joke, that's what it says. Prior to the events of Lunar 2, he corrupted the inhabitants of the Blue Star, and while the goddess Elthina helped defend them, the Blue Star was destroyed. Those living on the star were relocated to Lunar to give the Blue Star some time to heal. When Alfina gave up her immortality, Zophar slowly regained power, turning Alfina's own followers into an evil cult that suppressed those living on Lunar. He then revived a powerful magician named Galleon and got him to seal the dragons who protected the planet, allowing his power to flourish unopposed. After many years and installing a false Alfina to preach his words, our heroes emerge and take down the god with a little help on the side. You gotta give it to Zophar, he really planned this out and took his time. Number 9, Galdera, Octopath Traveler. Just so. The Gate of Finis. One of the 13 gods that created Ors Terra, Galdera the Fallen is Octopath Traveler's true final boss. Like most evil gods, Galdera's sole purpose is to consume all life, other gods included, so that he may be the only almighty being in existence. All of the seemingly unrelated plot threads from each of the eight characters all lead to this god's resurrection, from Hanit defeating the previous destined sacrifice, Red Eye, to the main antagonist of Ophelia's path making it his life's work to weaken the sacred flame and allow Galdera's power to seep from the gate of Finnis, where the god lies. This is mainly thanks to his daughter, Lyback, who was manipulating things from behind the scenes, orchestrating everything to allow her father to return. That's some insane dedication. Now, let's get down to business! I am ready. Number 8, The Pantheon, Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem. <laughs> Depending on your choice early on in the game, it shapes which ancient being influences your playthrough. You have Chaturga, the being of matter, an aggressive strength-based ancient that does little in the planning department, leaving it to Pius, the skeletal servant of the ancients. There's Zelotath, the goddess of insanity with a split personality and armed with sickening tactics, wishing to destroy all life on Earth only to revive them as her minions where they can then fight and torture one another for eternity. Lastly of the three main ancients, we have Ulioth, the absent horror, a master of magic and the planes, one who schemes and plots everything. It seems he would rather enslave humanity than outright kill them, as his minions are all still living, unlike the other two ancients where they are reanimated dead. There's a fourth ancient, Mantarok, also known as the corpse god or the god of chaos. It is said that Mantarok maintained an equilibrium among the ancients, but was weakened due to a spell cast by Pius to allow the other three ancients free reign. Unlike the other three, Mantarok was more benevolent to humanity, acting as a god of fertility while also setting in motion the plan to stop Pius and whatever god he chose to serve. However, it can be noted that there might be an ulterior motive behind Mantarok's wish in stopping the ancients from taking hold of Earth. It's a complicated twist of schemes. All of the ancients shine in their own way, as shown in short cutscenes throughout the game. It's interesting that you get to choose your main antagonist in this game, making the replay value soar. Do not underestimate the power of Mantarok. Warlock. 
Its power cannot be defined in terms you understand. Number 7. Mitra, Rudra no Hiho, or Treasure of the Rudras. The setting for Treasure of the Rudras is a unique one. Before the events of the game, we learn that the Majestic Four created the world, with Mitra being the most powerful out of all of them, being the creator of the Earth and the Moon. All of them gave life to an entity known as a Rudra, using the power from the Guardian of Evolution, Gamora, who churns out new beings. Every 4,000 years, a Rudra appears with a shiny new race to test out, with the race that came before it being destroyed or driven to the brink of extinction. From this, our heroes are trying to stop the end of humanity with 15 days before a new Rudra emerges. The heroes each come to possess a jade, a treasure that is used to create Rudras. Not wanting to be wiped off the face of the earth, the heroes eventually unite and force their way to Mitra, their god and creator, and stop the cycle of Rudras from ever happening again. Unfortunately, there was a good reason for all of these races tests. Long ago, the Majestic Four fought an enemy called the Destroyers, and while they won the battle, they knew the Destroyers would return more powerful and with the resolve to defeat them. The Majestic Four went on to create the perfect race, replacing weak ones with stronger ones until they themselves were defeated by their own creations. But they didn't mind this, knowing that humanity would be able to defend themselves against the Destroyer threat. While this method seems cruel, I completely understand why Mitra was doing it. Number 6, The Sinistrals, Lufia 2, Rise of the Sinistrals. Sinistrals throughout the game. Gades, the Sinistral of Destruction, who is the shit disturber who kicks things in motion. Amon, the Sinistral of Chaos, who sits on the side and controls influential figures from the shadows. Aram, the Sinistral of Death, the only one who can resurrect the Sinistrals should they die. And a major player in the main character, Maxim's Fate. And lastly, Daus, the master of terror and the leader of the Sinistrals. There is one last Sinistral that is hardly mentioned, Eric the Absolute, who acts as a distant observer of what takes place during the game. He is shown speaking only to Aram, who takes on the form of Iris, a traveling sorceress, to interact with our hero without revealing who she really is. It's through these interactions between Aram and Maxim that his fate changes, his bloodline is saved, and in the rebooted game on the Nintendo DS, is the the reason he and Selen are saved and reunited with their son in Parcelite. However, the Sinistrals are evil gods, flexing their muscles over humanity and controlling their lives. But with a Sinistral like Aram taking the side of humans, it shows they can turn to good. Number 5. Dark Gaia, Terranigma Another unique world here. There is the light or the surface world and dark, the underworld, which are represented by their creators, God and Devil. A war between the two beings caused the surface world to submerge into the sea while the underworld was sealed away. The Devil, or Dark Gaia as we learn later on, takes on the form of the Elder in Ark, our protagonist, village that he starts in. Urged to go on a journey that involves rebuilding humanity and reviving a certain mad scientist so that he may dominate the world that Ark resurrected directed for him. Eventually, Ark has his time to confront Dark Gaia after dying a few times and bearing a heavy sacrifice. He slays the Dark God. Soon, Ark realizes that he is a creation of Dark Gaia and he, along with everyone in his home village and the underworld itself, will vanish entirely now that the devil is dead. What a massive insult to our poor protagonist. Hooray, you restored the world, but you get to die before you see it flourish. As far as evil shit Dark Gods do, this one is pretty damn high up there. Four, Kefka Palazzo, Final Fantasy VI. Of course. 
course he was going to be on this list. He gains immeasurable power, and in the new world post Kefka going power crazy, he even has a group of worshippers. Though they're probably just worshipping him in order not to die a horrible death, rather than reveling in his godliness. Anyways, Kefka, the annoying jerk who's been a dick the entire game, gains his power from the warring triad, the three gods that descended from the heavens and immediately fought one another, fearing each other's power. They created the espers, magical beings that fought alongside them as slaves. Eventually, they agreed to seal away their power and gave their espers free will, who immediately fled to a new realm while the triad remained petrified in stone. Along comes Kefka, who awakens them, drains them of their power, and becomes the source of magic, transforming him into a godlike being with insane amounts of power and control over those who survived the destruction upon awakening the warring triad. He's basically three gods in one. It's insane. I do find it interesting that Kefka calls himself a god, not in the Super Nintendo version, but the Game Boy Advance port. Why they decided to add in the term god is beyond me, but it supports my reason for putting him on this list. So I can't complain. <laughs> Number 3. Creator, the Final Fantasy Legend We're going way back to the original Nintendo console with the Final Fantasy Legend. The basic premise is that at the center of the world is a tower that leads to paradise. Those enticed by the name challenge the tower, but usually never return. A new set of adventurers, your party, begin climbing the tower in hopes of reaching paradise. But unfortunately, it was all a ruse as a tuxedo and top hat wearing being congratulates them on being the first to finish their game. He wanted to test out people's courage and determination, creating the tower for that purpose. Upon offering the adventurers a wish, they refuse it. The creator then has a hissy fit, and they argue that they can do whatever they want because they created everything. The reason this entry is so high is that this is one of the very early games that had a normal god take on the role of an antagonist, even if it was right at the end. Most games released in 1989 were more focused on powerful magicians and sorcerers than godly beings. It was also a huge twist in the plot, at the time it was, so give it credit, with a kind of fourth wall breaking, in that the creator calls it a game, which is true to you, the player. Number 2. Valmar Grandia 2 This game was my first, not-so-obvious plot twist involving a god switcheroo. It clearly stuck with me till this day as it sits comfortably at number 2. Throughout the game, you are collecting pieces of Valmar, the god of darkness, in order to have them fully destroyed to prevent any part of the god from returning. Unfortunately, the Pope of Granis Cathedral, Zera, planned to resurrect the god and reveals to the party that during the battle of good and evil, Granis, the god of light, was the one who was defeated, with Valmar merely broken into pieces. All of the prayers to god, the people who asked for help along the party's journey, all of them were unknowingly speaking to Valmar. This is highlighted when you meet Ira and her mother, Sandra. It's explained that when Ira was a baby, she became very sick. Sandra then prayed to Granus for a cure, and if by some miracle, Ira was cured. However, Ira now possessed the extraordinary power to read people's minds, and then the problem around the village started. It was a very sick and twisted way to show that Valmar was the true god behind the scenes. I was relatively limited to what games I could play back in 2002, and this really weird twist in this game's story was amazing. It still is. Before we get to number one, here are some notable mentions. What? Change it's you! Number 1. Tyr or Myria, Breath of Fire 1 and 3.
There's no way this list is complete without Tyr or Miria or Maria taking the first spot. For the sake of my sanity, I'll be calling her Miria, as Breath of Fire 3 was my first game in the series. Miria makes her debut in Breath of Fire, the first game, where she offered promises of granting wishes and incited wars. She was the cause for the Light and Dark Dragon Clans to split when she offered up her power to whoever stood victorious. She was later sealed away by a hero with six keys, which created the plot of the first game, where the Dark Dragon Clan seek the keys to break the seal and have their wishes granted. She is defeated by Ryu and the party, but not before she tries to entice them with her powers, which opens up two different endings, one where she is defeated and one where she comes back. Fast forward to Breath of Fire 3, and she goes full crazy, acting as an overzealous mother to all creatures in the world, except for dragons. She labels the brood, as they're called in this game, as dangerous beings and wipes them out with her guardians. Despite the dragons not wanting to fight, the guardians slaughter them to near extinction. Anyone who opposed her brutal genocide was dealt with. This included her own sister Deus, who was sealed away under the Angel Tower, and Yggdrasil, the Trees of Wisdom, who was sealed in a hidden location on the map. Miria then shaped history to portray dragons as demons who tried to destroy the world, altering it so that she was seen as the savior of all life. Of course, the last remaining brood, Ryu, confronts her, but again she gives him a choice. Give up his dragon powers and be cut off from the world, or fight. After being defeated, she laments that the world would soon perish without her guidance, with Deus appearing to tell her that the mortals will be alright. 